Do you want to share or do you want to? Um, I kind of remember because there was one yeah, here. Like I so remember. We okay. Can I think we each have one. Okay. We can get one or maybe we can move it a little bit further. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's true. You're all plugged in, right? Yes, sir. All right, can you play for me? It was over here, that's all, right. I just turned and I thought he wanted me over here. It'll be all right. Oh. All right. Thank you. So that's yours. Where did mine go? Oh, it's right behind it. Okay. <laughs> when I lift it forward, there was nothing there. Yeah. It must have just it, stuck, it stuck to it. Stuck
Yeah, you know, I, 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 I tried to make a suggestion that we, like, get a space where, like, during GA we could just have, like, a little jam room. I'll be just, yep. I, I'm supposed to look at you anyway, so I'll just turn over to the beginning. Keeps me on my toes. Introduction. I love it. We are credited. It's where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> not, not ready to parole yet. Oh, look at our military clothes. That's awesome. Deep. They're both decent. When in doubt, play deep. That's all drama, though. Oh, sure. Can you make it any easier? Have you easier? read her book, oh, Orange yeah. is New Black? It's a yeah. very good um, expose. For I just need to be able to turn to her, so I need a little bit of angle. I need to be able to see what she's doing on the banjo occasionally. So. Right. Okay, back up. It's like giving your child, a, your five-year-old child, a five-hour timeout instead of a five-minute timeout, and they don't learn. Details, details. Just scream. Mm. Yes. Good morning, my friends. Reverend Cecilia Kingman and I are pleased to lead you in worship this morning. We open our first full day of General Assembly with the beautiful hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Unitarian John Wyeth included this melody in his repository of sacred music in 1812. The original text by Robert Robertson was adapted for Unitarian Universalists by the Reverend Eugene B. Navius, who passed away last, late last summer. In his long career, Reverend Navius created lasting ties between ministry, religious education, and hymnody, especially with his GA presentation on singing, shouting, and celebrating. Please rise in body or spirit to sing, shout, and celebrate the grace we seek together this week. Teacher. 
Good morning. We are honored to have here with us to light our chalice this morning the Reverend Dr. Emily Bro, who serves as chaplain at Coffee Creek Correctional Facility, a women's prison in Wilsonville, Oregon. The chalice, this beloved symbol of our free faith, reminds us that we are larger even than this assembled body this week. Let us call to mind all who keep to this faith tradition across this land, in our congregations and communities, and in the prisons and streets as well. And let us also call into this space all of our siblings in faith around the world from Transylvania to Cuba, from Iceland to Burundi. And, lest we not forget them, let us also call into this place, into our midst, all who have come before us, those blessed ones who dreamed of religious freedom who preached the love of God for all people, and those martyrs who lost their lives for our faith. Let us give thanks for this great cloud of witnesses. May our work today honor them all. Amen. Our centering reading this morning is an ancient story, thousands of years old, first told by a peasant prophet and wisdom teacher, Jesus of Nazareth. This version comes from the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, which is not included in the regular canonical Bible. Before I tell you this story, an invitation in how to listen. Scholars tell us that Jesus, as a wisdom teacher, used parables that were oblique and hard to understand. So like a Japanese koan, if you think you know the meaning, you probably haven't got it. So let us hear this ancient parable and seek the deepest wisdom in it without any need for certainty. Jesus said, listen, a sower came forth, filled his hand, and cast the seed. Some fell upon the road. The birds came and picked them out. Others fell upon the rocky ground. They found no means of taking root in the soil and did not send up 
ears. And others fell among the thorns, and they choked the seed, and the grubs devoured them. And others fell upon the good earth, and this portion sent up good fruit. It gave as much as sixty-fold, and even a hundred and twenty-fold per measure. Thus ends the reading. Sarah Watkins, young American singer-songwriter and fiddler, wrote the song Take Up Your Spade for her second solo album. At the end of each verse, please feel free to join us on the refrain. Take up your spade and break ground. Two, three, Sun is up, a new day is before you. Sun is up, wake your sleepy soul. Sun is up, hold out on to what is yours. Take up your spade and break ground. Will you pray with me? Spirit of life, God who is love, I thank you for this gathering of good souls and the chance to work and worship together today. We gather with great hopes and aspirations. Help us also gather in humility. We long for a new way of human living, a new vision, a new day. Help us remember that we are not the only people with visions and longings. Help us to listen more than we speak, learn more than we instruct, love more than we critique. Help us be together this week in kindness and compassion and true humility. Source of wisdom, dwell among us and help us discern our role in an ever turbulent world. Be our vision, show us the way we seek and keep us from false prophecy and the temptations of ego. Turn our hearts to your purpose 
and your way, the way of wisdom and compassion. Above all, help us remember that we are all held in a greater love. Help us remember that nothing can separate us from your love, not principalities nor powers, not governments nor police, not the actions of other people, nor the cycles of history, not our place in society's strata, not even the errors of our own ways. Nothing can remove us from your vast and abiding embrace. Help us know that love and live that love outward toward all your creatures this day and all the days to come. I ask this in the name of all that is sacred. Amen. Two, three, four. Take up your spade and break ground. I love doing that. I now call to order the second general session of the 54th General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Are the delegates ready to do the business of this association of congregations? Now, I told you last night there'd be a test. Are you ready for it? What does rule six cover? See, you didn't do your homework last night. Those of you from the East, you woke up at three or four, you should have had time to do this. It's on time limits, it's on time limits. It's good to be in Portland on this Thursday morning. The sun is out, the humidity is low. Where I come from, that's a good thing to say. Um, and the Supreme Court did the right thing this morning. Did you, did you get that? They upheld the uh, Obamacare uh, subsidies. Six, six to three, six to three. So um, Kennedy and Roberts were on the liberal side, so I'm just, I'm delighted to report that. I come from one of those states that decided it didn't need to accept those billions to help the poor recover their health and live longer, so I'm delighted. Does the Right Relationship team have something to report this morning? I believe I do, they do since I see them uh, at, the, at the ramp. So welcome back, Rakit Razik Brown. Good morning. Before we begin, I'd like to share a piece of the voice that the Right Relationship team will bring this week. I'd like to hold up there will be many workshops that speak to the racial injustice in this, na in this nation this week. Many will highlight the death and mass incarceration of black, of black people, people of African descent. In many of those workshops, in your personal conversations, the term Black Lives Matter will come up. I'd like to share that when I say Black Lives Matter, I do not mean that in a, mean that in a philosophical or academic sense. I mean that my life matters, the lives of your ministers matter, the lives of your lay leaders, congregants, and fellow attendees matter. Forgiveness is a virtue shared by all people who strive for peace in their lives, but I would like to hold up that righteous anger, sadness, and pain are also part of the human experience that our religious tradition of justice seeking speaks to. My father, Dr. James T. Brown, worked for this association and loved this faith. I now too work for this organization and love this faith. Time and time again, this religion has showed me that my life and the lives of those I love matter. The association and my father's hard work led me to be the man that stands on this stage today. When he began his descent into the end that awaits us all, my local congregation stepped up to support my mother and I. 
When I needed help in my darkest days after he passed, it was peers like Kenny Wiley, another UU who lost a parent, that helped me heal. Discussions will happen. Resolutions will or will not get passed. But I know that no matter what our human failings, when the people of my faith truly love with an open heart and an open mind, Black Lives Matter. Now on to business. In the words of one of our predecessors, Garner Takahashi Morris, the goal of the Right Relationship Team is to support General Assembly participants. In a community of this size, we are blessed to have so many perspectives and experience in one place. When the inevitable happens and our trust and faith in each other is broken, we, the team, will do our best to help you rebuild that faith and that trust. Very plainly, we exist to take the pulse of the community for the GA Planning Committee and every one of you here. Whilst carrying out those duties, we endeavor to make sure everyone feels safe. If they don't, then we try to find them the help they need. We are not enforcers. We are not ushers. We are not complaint boxes. And while some of us are ministers, we are not chaplains. Why do we do what we do? Well, to make a long story short, once there was a general assembly where many participants felt that when they came into conflict with other members of our beloved community, there were no channels to create healthy dialogue between themselves, other participants, the community, and the GA planning committee. What ended up happening was that, many, was that much of the business that gets done at GA was put on hold. Many people's nights were ruined. Some people, my own friends, left the faith altogether. From that, let's call it growth moment, the Right Relationship Team was born. We are a group of volunteers, just like you, who like helping people, serving their faith, and having healthy dialogue. What does that look like? Well, let's say you have an issue with another attendee. For example, an attendee stands up in the middle of general session and starts loudly swearing at the top of their lungs. First, try and talk to them about it. Ask them why they are swearing and if they could please stop. If that does not work or you feel like you might need help getting a conversation started, you can come to one of us in the, in, in the orange gear. If you feel you need pastoral care because profanity is triggering for you, we will find a chaplain. If you feel you've noticed a trend of people standing in the middle of GA events and swearing loudly, talk to us and we will send that information to the GAPC via our annual report. We will also remind the conference the following day that swearing in a room full of people loudly is very disruptive behavior. <laughs> Does that sound straightforward enough? Great. While I'm here, let me just get this out of the way now. If you're having a bathroom-related issue, by that I mean where the restrooms are located, how much traffic is going into the restrooms, or who is using the restroom at all, there's probably nothing any of us on the Right Relationship team can do about it. You can trust me when I say, somewhere in this building is a restroom just for you. <laughs> just ask someone on, vo on volunteer staff and they will help you find it. Let us remember our Unitarian Universalist commitment to the worth and dignity of all people. The Unitarian Universalist Association affirms its commitment to maintain an environment free of discrimination, harassment, and harassment based on race, color, national origin, religion, age, sex, sexual orientation, or disability. The association expects all attendees to conduct themselves in a professional manner with concern and respect for all. As a courtesy, please allow persons using wheelchairs and scooters to exit meeting rooms first. Also, please leave elevators free for the use of persons using wheelchairs and scooters. Please remember that a chaplain is available at any hour during GA for assistance in case of personal of personal emergency or need for pastoral care. Office hours and after hours phone numbers will be posted and they are in your book. Thank you, enjoy the conference, and have a pleasant morning. Thanks, Razik. Now we welcome the Reverend Chip Roush, who's chair of the General Assembly Planning Committee, affectionately called GAPC. The GAPC is a committee of the association authorized by the bylaws, Article 5, Section 5.8. Chip, let us meet the team. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. 
I often say that our General Assembly is an interesting blend of business meeting and state fair. We gather to do the business of the association. We gather to mourn and to celebrate. And we gather to share our ideas and best practices. General Assembly can be a transformational experience. It is not the job of the General Assembly Planning Committee to create the moments of potential transformation. That's for the speakers, presenters, musicians, and all of our human cousins who arrive with good questions and tales of their congregation's creative ideas. We of the Planning Committee help to create the structure in which all of you co-create transformative moments for each other. Just as our annual program fund amplifies Unitarian Universalism, the Planning Committee helps amplify the possibilities when meeting several thousand other UUs. The work of the Planning Committee can be difficult, challenging, exhausting, and immensely rewarding. We and the rest of our Unitarian Universalist Association are always looking for new leaders. If you think you would like to serve on the planning committee, please look up the nominating committee process online at uua.org. Finally, allow me to introduce this year's GA planning committee. It is truly my pleasure to serve with these good people. Mary Alm, Deborah Gray Boyd, Greg Boyd is Kathy Charles, Isla Cleon, Paul Langston Daly, Tim Murphy, and the Director of General Assembly and Conference Services for our UUA, Jan Sneekes. Thank you all. Thank you, Chip, and um, thanks to the GAP. It GAPC and all the volunteers that uh, make this gathering come together, sometimes seamlessly, mostly. Um, and they've been doing double duty since that, uh, that missing pallet uh, is moving around the country. Trust me, they've, uh, they've had some sleepless nights trying to pull the substitutes together for you. The Commission on Social Witness is another important committee of the association articulated in our bylaws, Article 5, Section 5.10. So please welcome the chair of your Commission on Social Witness, Dr. Susan Geckler. Susan? Thank you, Jim. If you pay attention to our report, you should be able to answer a quiz at the end. And I don't know if the tech deck has our slides that we, were, that we sent in advance, but maybe they're on the truck, on the pallet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in your, in your uh, CSW alert, if you picked it up this morning, you will see that there are a whole bunch of initials. So the initials that you need to know at the end of this little presentation today are CSW, AIW, CSAI, RJ, SOC, EI, and APF. Okay, you ready for the, for the, so pay attention so you can get the quiz at the end. Okay, so CSW equals the Commission on Social Witness. And um, the members of that are the Reverend Dr. David Breeden, who was appointed in 2011, Ms. Caitlin Cotter, who was appointed in 2013, uh, Dr. Reverend Christina Solari, who was elected in 2013, Mr. Richard Bach, who was appointed in 2015, and me, who I was elected in 2011. You can identify the elected and appointed members of the Commission on Social Witness by the blue baseball caps we wear when on duty. We are here to help you navigate the opportunities at GA and to contribute to social witness statements. What we did in 2014 to 15, well, we are volunteers, but we work all year. Between 2014 and 2015 General Assemblies of the UUA, the Commission on Social Witness, or CSW, drafted a Statement of Conscience, or SOC, on reproductive justice, which is RJ. 
and we solicited comments on the draft and revised the draft ba based on the comments that we received. You can find the revised statement in the business agenda starting on page 95. We also solicited comments on the Congregational Study Action Issue, that's CSAI, that was selected in 2014, which was on escalating inequality, that's the EI. Statements of conscience should stand the test of time and state general moral principles, not refer to specific laws or immediate political issues. They should state what we believe and not necessarily what is current law. And we try to make them so that they generally apply to any nation, they're not limited to US specific issues. For a statement of conscience to be added to the business agenda, which is what's on page 95, at least 25% of certified congregations must cast a vote in the congregational poll to add it to the agenda. By the February 3rd deadline this year, 544 of the 957 certified congregations, or 57% of the congregations, voted either yes, no, or abstain to the question about adding the statement of conscience on reproductive justice, that's SOC on RJ, to the final agenda. Of those who voted, 389 voted yes, five voted no, and 150 abstained. This met the 25% threshold and therefore it is on the agenda. Some other things that the CSW did, and we're reporting to you because we report to the General Assembly, we are not a committee of the board. The commissioners also revised information on the UUA website that explains the CSAI process. We judge submissions for the social witness sermon contest that the CSW co-sponsors with the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association. In April, the CSW announced on the CSW website and the CSW and GA email lists and on our Facebook page that those planning to submit an action of immediate witness, that's an AIW, could post their ideas on the CSW portion of the UUA website. I um, want to say that the work of the CSW is supported by the UUA through the annual program fund, the APF, and we work to amplify the work of you, the members and the congregations out there. So what is an AIW, an, an action of immediate witness? Well, statements of conscience carry the full weight of the denomination because they involve several years of study and action and multiple opportunities for congregational input. Some issues, however, might come up quickly. Sometimes things happen in this world, like a Supreme Court decision. Um, and delegates decide that they want to make a statement related to that. So to address such, delegates at the General Assembly may propose discuss and vote on actions of immediate witness. They must meet certain criteria, something that requires immediate action to make an impact, something that is specific and narrow, something that doesn't duplicate a recent AIW, something that is grounded in UU theology and practice, something that fits with congregation's ability to make, take meaningful action, and something that presents a chance for congregations to become respected participants in the public dialogue. During the General Assembly, the CSW will provide help to those who are proposing AIWs, which must be posted by today at five o'clock in the CSW booth, which is number 206. Once they are posted, proposers then have to collect signatures. So if you are a delegate, you may have people coming around with clipboards asking you to sign for their AIW in support of their AIW. 
They have until tomorrow at 5 o'clock to collect 150 signatures, and they must be from multiple congregations and multiple regions of the country. Saturday morning, if you're, if when you come in, you will receive a CSW alert, which is like what you received this morning, but it will be a different color. And on there, you will see uh, a short description or abstract of up to six proposed AIWs. Your job, if you're a delegate on Saturday morning, will be to select three of those that you would like the General Assembly to consider for possible adoption. The vote to adopt them is on Sunday afternoon. The only place that you can propose amendments or changes to either the Statement of Conscience or an AIW is at a mini-assembly. The mini-assembly for the Statement of Conscience on Reproductive Justice is today at 1.15. So if you look at the statement that's in your program book and you would like to learn more about it or you would like to suggest some changes to it, please come to that. That's the only place where you can propose changes. This similarly for actions of immediate witness, once the three have been chosen on Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, there will be mini assemblies and those, that would be the only place where people can suggest changes to the proposed language of those three A AIWs before they are voted on on Sunday for possible adoption by this general assembly. Some other things that are happening at the General Assembly that the CSW is working on. Um, there is an implementation workshop on the SOC on Reproductive Justice Friday afternoon. So assuming that you, as delegates, decide to adopt a statement on reproductive justice, then come to the workshop to find out some ways that you and your congregation might engage with the process. And we are also, there will be a serv the service of the sermon contest today at 4.45. Um, there are other opportunities are in your CSW alert of workshops that relate to the various uh, CSAIs. I want to mention that there's one new opportunity for witness that we are offering this year, and that is if there are individuals who want to collect signatures for their own petitions, they aren't seeking support from the denomination as an official statement, such as an AIW or an SOC. They can come and leave that at the booth. We are providing this as a service. We're not going to be uh, promoting those as the commission, but we want to give every opportunity for you to have a social witness voice if that is something you desire. So, now that we have gone over all of these for the quiz, um, what, I'm going to call it out and you call it out to me. What does CSW stand for? Very good. What does CSAI stand for? Good. Statement SOC. AIW. RJ. EI. That was a little bit rougher. <laughs> Pretty good. And then the APF, the annual program fund that supports our work. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Our next presenters are the Reverend Michael Tino and Alandria Williams of the Presidential Search Committee. This is our newest committee of the association authorized by the bylaws. Please welcome Michael and Alandria. <laughs> Good morning, General Assembly. Okay, that was very weak. Good morning, General Assembly. Good morning. Much better. I'm Elandria Williams. And I'm Michael Tino. And we're here to update you this morning on the progress of the Presidential Search Committee. As you might be aware, the General Assembly built a new way to nominate candidates to run for the president of the UUA. Our committee was elected two years ago to design a process that had never existed before. An open, transparent, accountable process by which nominees for the next UA presidential election would be chosen. 
And we think we've done that with your help. Over the past two years, we've interviewed dozens of stakeholders and representatives. We've surveyed all Unitarian Universalists who wanted to have a say in the process. And we've kept you all in the loop through regular postings on our blog and our Facebook page. From all of this, we have created a job description for the president of our committee for the president our committee is looking for. To be sure, is an ambitious job description for an important job. We also created a process by which we intend to select our applicants, a process that is publicly available on our blog. Beginning last fall, we asked you to suggest the people that you thought best matched this job description. To date, almost 50 people have been suggested to us. Women, men, transgender and genderqueer people, straight, gay, lesbian, and bisexual people, people of Asian, Native American, Latina, Latino, African, and European descent, and of mixed ancestry, people ranging in age from their mid-20s to their mid-70s. Each person suggested was sent an encouragement to apply for our nomination and given several channels to discuss their discernment process with the committee. All discernment, however, must soon end. The final deadline for applications is July 15th. Once again, the final deadline for applications is July 15th. Between July and December, we will carefully read all of the applications submitted. We will interview applicants, check references, and have deep conversations. And then we will nominate those applications, those applicants, who best exemplify the things in our job description at least two of them, but possibly more. Those nominations will be released to the public on February 1st of next year, at which point a campaign will begin, culminating in a vote at General Assembly 2017 in New Orleans. But one final time, we need your help. We need you to ensure that we have the best possible candidates for the future presidency of our denomination. We need you to talk with the people you want to apply to tell them why you suggested them to us, to tell them why they need to submit their application. Because those applications are due July 15th. <laughs> we look forward to meeting the applicants and to introducing you to the next candidates for UUA president. Thank you. Thank you, so that's the process for the new president it's my pleasure to welcome our current president of the association, the Reverend Peter Morales, who will be joined by the leadership council of his team. Thank you. Well, good morning, Portlandia. Interesting that they have me following the presidential search committee. I It's great to be here, and it's great to be at the largest GA in a number of years. There's something about a GA that has really high attendance. We're going to be close to 5,000, I understand, uh, before we're done. That's terrific. <laughs> Returning to Oregon is always special for me, because 20 years ago, I began my own UU journey in Eugene, Oregon, about two hours south of here. <laughs> Hello, Eugene. <laughs> Be a duck. All right. This is my sixth report as your president. And so very much has happened. I've been thinking about the things that we have done together that I'm most proud of. That scene of a sea of yellow shirts and candles outside of Tent City at Justice GA in Phoenix is a precious memory. I recall how thousands of UU showed up at the Moral March in North Carolina and the Climate March in New York City. And I remember launching the College of Social Justice with the UU Service Committee. I think of how our staff, your staff, worked thousands of extra hours to imagine and design a headquarters for the 21st century. Do you see a pattern? We are at our best when we work together. 
together with other UUs, with our sister congregations, and with other faiths, with organizations that are working for compassion and justice. Together, we're not only more powerful, but together we create new possibilities. In this morning's report, I want to tell you about a small sample of what our association is doing to shape the future. I want you to feel proud of what your association is doing. Your generosity fuels our work, and together we amplify the love and the power of Unitarian Universalism. I'm going to ask a couple of my colleagues in our leadership council to tell you about some of the work that they're heading up. But right now I want to briefly introduce the members of our leadership council. First is Harlan Limpert. He's our chief operating officer. He runs the day-to-day -day operations of the UUA. Harlan is really the wizard behind the curtain at the UUA. Teresa Cooley is our program and strategy officer. Boy, they all have fans. <laughs> she oversees and coordinates all of our program areas. Sarah Lambert is director of ministries and faith development. The Queen of Boston leads our multicultural growth and witness staff group. Scott Taylor is director of congregational life. He oversees our field staff all across the country. John Hurley is head of communications. He oversees the public witness team, UU World, Skinner House Books, and the bookstore. Tim Brennan is our treasurer and chief financial officer. And he also leads our shareholder advocacy work, which is so important. Mark Steinwinner leads our information technology team. Rob Moll is head of human resources and led the design team for our new headquarters. Mary Catherine Morn leads our stewardship and development staff group. And Helen Atwan, uh, who you'll hear from later, she's director of Beacon Press, was not able to be here this morning. They are an amazing, amazing team. And in addition to getting a flavor of important work, I want you to see how we're doing our best work, because how we do it is as important as the work that is being done. And third, then, I want to share with you what I see as our great challenges and opportunities in the coming years. Let me begin with some of the, the terrific work that's going on. And one of those is a program in entrepreneurial ministry. Look, we all know that we live in times of historic change in our religious institutions. Religious leaders today need to lead change, to innovate, to take risks. Together with the UU Ministers Association, we're partnering with leading business school faculty across the country. And I want to show you a short clip from the first session uh, about six months ago at Asilomar. The American religious landscape has probably changed more in the last 10 or 15 years than it did in the previous 200. And we need to find new ways of engaging people who are still spiritually hungry, but are very wary and skeptical about traditional institutions. The Pew Foundation did a survey and found 600,000 people or so in the U.S. identify as UU. But we only have 150,000 as members in our congregations. So what's going on there? Where's the disconnect? And I think that that demands that we experiment with different models. We need to get out of our churches, out of our chaplaincy institutions like the one I'm in and so on, and get out and innovate in the larger world because that's where, where things are happening and that's where the needs are. The congregation model continues to sustain the hearts of many, many people, but they will not carry us alone. They will not carry us into the future. Uh, so this work is vital, it's absolutely vital. This work, beyond the call entrepreneurial ministry, is the Unitarian Universalist Association and the UU Ministers Association in partnership with professors and lecturers in leading business schools. Project Portfolios in Hand, a group of mostly UU ministers, along with some United Church of Christ and Jewish clergy, are learning things they don't get in seminary, like innovation and design. 
But we wanted to begin this two-year program in partnership with one of the preeminent schools in kind of the, the cradle, if you will, of innovation. So the first of our four retreats is with Stanford. Two or three core central pivot points where designs build your way forward thing actually you know, touches earth and makes a difference. And we're gonna dive into it in some depth today on your projects. The first training featured Dave Evans from the Stanford Design School and UCC Minister Nicole Lamarche, who planted a church in the Silicon Valley. You must develop the art of being clear in the face of uncertainty. So the entrepreneurial ministry program is an opportunity to catalyze all the things that are cooking out there. And and I think there's a potential for it to have a transformative impact on our faith and on Unitarian Universalists and on people who are seeking but may not know that what they could be seeking is, is Unitarian Universalism. This is just our first meeting. I can't imagine where it's gonna, where it's gonna go. If you're interested in advancing religious values that are progressive in the world, if you are looking for a way to put your financial resources where your values are, if you understand the relationship between leadership and making change in the world, that this is the program that would enable you to achieve all of those things. Thank you. As I travel around the country, I meet UUs of all ages who are eager to make a difference, hungry for an opportunity to bear witness to another way. Public witness isn't just political action, it's spiritual practice. During the last year, images of police killing unarmed black men has shocked us all. In Ferguson and Baltimore and Cleveland and elsewhere, we continue to raise our voices. I want to ask Tequina Boston, director of our Multicultural Growth and Witness staff team, to talk about our commitment going forward. At a recent gathering of multi-faith leaders, those leaders grappled with the question, what must we, the multi-faith movement, do to advance racial justice? The UUA surveyed Unitarian Universalist asking a similar question about our faith's role in advancing racial justice. The consistent response, we must follow the lead of communities of color, those who suffer most from the evils of racism, economically, politically, socially, culturally, bodily, and spiritually. All over the country, Unitarian Universalists are engaging Black Lives Matter, not one more, and understanding how racial justice is at the heart of the climate justice, economic justice, the new Jim Crow, immigration, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer equity, and reproductive justice movements. In partnership with you, the UUA provides financial and spiritual resources and support with witness, advocacy, and social media. This General Assembly offers substantive opportunities to network and strategize with frontline racial justice leaders to build a new way to beloved community. This fall, the UUA will unite Unitarian Universalist and non-UU organizers and leaders, including Black Lives Matter, to identify our faith's particular role in advancing racial justice. 50 years ago, Unitarian Universalist answered the call to Selma, Alabama, in support of voting rights for African Americans living in the South. We marched, witnessed, organized, and worked in solidarity with communities of color. Today's call of love, faith, and justice is no less urgent. And Unitarian Universalists are again saying yes 
yes, yes. And say yes to the Morrill March on July 13th in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Voting rights must be defended and we must show up. Thank you, Tequina. Because we're at our best when we work together, we need to remove barriers that separate us and make collaboration difficult. It no longer makes sense to have our staff in the field divided into 19 separate districts. In the last few years, we've made tremendous progress in creating one unified national staff. This effort has gone by the name of regionalization. Scott Taylor, our director of Congregational Life, has been doing heroic work to move this along. Scott, tell us where we are and why you're so passionate about this work. Thanks, Peter. Regionalization, as Peter said, is one of our UUA's most creative, extensive, and inspiring undertakings. Again, as Peter mentioned, practically speaking, it involves restructuring ourselves from 19 largely independent districts into five stronger, more aligned regions. Each region is pursuing this structural streamlining and collaboration in their own unique way, but all every single one of them are, are seeing tremendous gifts. We have reduced administrative and governance redundancies, freed up capacity for more congregational support, and created larger, more flexible, and better integrated field staff teams. But the larger gift is spiritual. From its beginning, Regionalization has been about modeling and embodying our theology of interdependence. This is ultimately why the UUA has made it a priority. The larger hope is to inspire and support a similar deepening of relationship between our congregations and our covenanted communities. As we all move together into the ever-increasing challenges of 21st century church life, there is less and less room for the imagined autonomy of the past. Regionalization's great gift to all of us is its invitation to shift from being an association of independent congregations to an association of radically interdependent congregations. This, friends, is the wider journey of which regionalization is a part. It is an exciting journey, even a holy one. Thanks to the many district and associational leaders that have helped us see that and continue to see that clearly. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Something struck me. 10 years ago while I was serving as a parish minister in Colorado. As I stood out front greeting people on Sunday morning, I realized that most first-time visitors already recognized me and knew my name. While this was their first physical visit to our congregation, they had been visiting electronically for some time. Our website was our true front door. Not only is your congregation's website your front door, UUA.org is the front door for our movement. Our website is often the gateway to your website. Last year, UUA.org received over one million first-time visitors, an increase of almost 10% over the previous year. And in truth, our movement's front door has been needing some sprucing up for some time. This was a huge effort, for our site has something like 20,000 pages on it. We had to rebuild from the foundation up, and I think our staff did a tremendous job. And you, you've told us that your congregation's websites often need sprucing up also. So we have created a template that congregations can use, and we're unveiling that template at this general assembly. In addition, in addition, we've completely redone uuaworld.org. The site is also mobile friendly. In fact, you can follow a lot of GA stuff on it. 
One of the important ways we promote our values is our book publishing. Beacon Press continues to be a thought leader in social justice. Beacon has really been on a roll lately. It's increasing the number of books that they publish, and this year's Ware Lecturer, the Reverend Dr. Cornell West, is a Beacon author. Last year, Beacon authors spoke at over 500 events across the country. And Skinner House continues to publish wonderful titles on an ever broader number of subjects. Here's a picture of a sample of, of some of their titles. Check them out at the bookstore, in the exhibit hall, and we've got some great swag there that you need to check out as well. Because of our respect for all religious traditions, Unitarian Universalist ministers are particularly suited to chaplaincy duties where they're people of many faiths. For many years, we've done this work in hospitals and hospice settings. In recent years, the number of UU ministers serving in the military has grown significantly. Those who served in our armed forces are mostly young people from a wide variety of religious backgrounds who find themselves thrown into immensely stressful situations. We have a few of our military chaplains here today, and I want to thank you for your service. And we could show the, the camera on the... I ask you to please rise. Thank you. Thank you. Our work in this ministry continues to expand. Sarah Lambert, our Director of Ministries and Faith Development, has been voted the chair-elect of the National Conference on Ministry to the Armed Forces. Yeah. Sarah is the second woman and the first Unitarian Universalist to hold this important position, and it's a great honor. But, but our ministry to people who serve in the military isn't just the work of military chaplains. We have created resources to help all of our congregations participate in this important ministry. So what makes all of this terrific work possible? You do. Your support makes it happen. All of our work happens because our member congregations support our association through the annual program fund. And together we amplify our power and our voices. A fun way to learn more about your association, meet leaders, and connect with other UUs is to join the APF scavenger hunt throughout the day tomorrow. And you can get the Scavify, I didn't make up the word, Scavify app on your phone. That should be a lot of fun. I said earlier that our best work has come when we create partnerships. Partnerships are not just organizational tactics. Partnerships is how we live out our theology. We are a religious movement who has always believed that when people come together and freely commit themselves to one another and to their highest aspirations, that blessings will abound. We're building relationships on so many levels. Your board of trustees and the administration have formed a true partnership. Clusters of congregations are working together as never before. We're collaborating with advocates for justice, partnering with the service committee, with the UUMA, and building relationships with other faith traditions. And we're doing this not because it's organizationally smart, though it is, but because when we connect with common purpose, we unleash power and we create new opportunities. Love is a relationship, and when love guides us, we seek ways to act together. Now, I want to look at the coming years and some of the challenges that we're going to be facing. We face some awesome challenges and really some historic opportunities, and they go together, of course. Seven years ago, when I was a candidate for president, I talked a lot about the fact that half of our parish ministers were 58 years of age and older, 
and they, we were going to be facing a huge turnover. Then the economic crisis hit, and the high number of retirements did not materialize. All that has changed. At this GA service of the living tradition, we will honor a record number of retirees. And if we could show the chart, I want to show you the number of retirees in the last five years. That's 34 in 2011, 31 in 2012, 27 in 13, 57 last year, and 66 this year. We suddenly do not have enough interim ministers to fill all the positions in our association. But there's another side. The number of people expressing an interest in UU ministry is rising, and the quality of our new ministers is outstanding. The Quakers have a wonderful saying, when way closes, way will open. Traditional congregational life faces challenges, challenges ranging from a changing culture that is skeptical of traditional religious organizations to a generational changing of the guard in ministry. At the same time, we have a wonderful opportunity, an outpouring of creativity and passion in a variety of emerging groups. Our staff is working closely with them and to nurture their efforts. And your board of trustees is changing the very definition of a congregation to accommodate this creativity in our movement. And beyond the challenges we face as a religious movement, we face challenges as human beings living on Earth. The greatest of these is climate change caused by the fuels that we burn to support the way that we live. Environmental justice is the focus of our public witness at this General Assembly, but more importantly, it will shape the very future of humanity. And we are all part of the problem. And we, therefore, must all be part of creating a solution. The commit to respond effort is a part of an effort to build a new way. Last year, we passed a business resolution on fossil fuel divestment. Tim Brennan, our treasurer, has worked closely with our investment committees. Our work goes beyond divestment to include climate solution investments and shareholder advocacy. What's going on in this area is very complicated. If you're interested in this and you ought to be, I urge you to learn the details at the workshop number 237 at 115 today. Every time I attend a public witness event, whether it's about immigration or voting rights, anti-racism, environmental justice, or marriage equality, there are other faith leaders there as well. There are Protestants, Jews, Catholics, Muslims, Hindus, and others. And we find that we work together easily. We've moved beyond tolerance to acceptance and even to appreciation. We form strong relationships. But what we never do is reach out together to serve the spiritual needs of millions of religiously homeless people. I'm convinced that the future of liberal religion is interfaith and multi-faith. We have a historic opportunity to work together to create a multi-faith future. I recently hosted a meeting of leaders from the United Church of Christ, the Union for Reformed Judaism, the Islamic Circle of North America, Religions for Peace, and the United Religions Initiative to explore how we might collaborate. We're at the very early stages of this work, but I can tell you that we're all committed to doing it. General Assembly next year in Columbus, Ohio, will have a multi-faith focus. This theme is Heart Land, where faiths connect. We UUs have an essential leadership role to play helping face to connect because we're multi-faith at our very core. There's so much more that I'd love to tell you about. I actually urge you to check out what your association is doing on our annual report on the web. Your staff is doing important work. And maybe, just maybe, I'm a little biased, but I think 
that our association right now has the finest staff that it has ever had. And I would like to recognize our staff. Please rise as you're able this morning. This is your staff. Thank you. You, all of you make the work of our association possible. Together, we are so much stronger, so much more creative. Together, we can face our challenges and seize this historic opportunity that lies before us. And finally, on a personal note, thank you once again for the great privilege of serving as your president. Good morning again. Please welcome David Service of Corvallis, Oregon. He's our GA accompanist, and he's going to be helping me at the piano this morning with some plenary song breaks. I'm going to continue in the same vein as our devotional music this morning and invite you to sing an American folk song, number 357 in Singing the Living Tradition. True to folk traditions, the provenance of this lovely hymn is unknown, and there are many variations in lyrics and tune in the, ver in the versions that have been recorded and written down. The song harks back to an agrarian society with members of the family sowing and tilling the fields for sustenance, praying and shouting in the valley and up to heaven, greeting the bright morning light, whether it be the planet Venus, the sun, or the figurative day star. Please rise in body or spirit to join in singing Bright Morning Stars Arising. Bright morning stars are Morning stars, bright morning stars rising, bright morning stars are rising, bright morning stars are rising. Day is 
Thank you, that was so beautiful. Please be seated. It sounded good from up here. Imagine a healthy Unitarian Universalist community that is alive with transforming power, moving our communities in the world toward more love, justice, and peace. Those words are the preamble of our association's shared vision or global ends in our governance language. They can be found in full on page 115 of your program book and, of course, on the UUA website and your app. Thousands of UUs participated in shaping those ends or shared vision, beginning right here in Portland in 2007, eight years ago. Our 10 enumerated ends have been, in the, have been the foundation of the generative discussion that your board of trustees, senior staff, and committee members have had over the past several years. These generative discussions have led to the governance and bylaw changes you'll consider at this GA, with more to come. The covenanting communities that you will meet later this morning, the collaborative work with the UUSC, the GA talks that will be presented reimagining our democratic process, and the budget that we will report this morning, all linked to our ends. These ends are what inform and animate your volunteer board and moderator, working to create that healthy, Unitarian, Universalist community that is alive with transforming power, moving our communities and the world toward more love, justice, and peace. As I've visited congregations, I've been speaking this year on being bold, brave, and bodacious, and reflecting on what that shared vision calls us to do, what radical hospitality looks like, what prophetic witness can be. And if we were all, if we were all on our congregations in our annual program fund, how much we could amplify those ends our vision of beloved community. There are bold and brave and bodacious in initiatives almost everywhere I've been. Immigration justice activities in California and Arizona, the Moral Monday movement in North Carolina, climate justice initiatives with the Commit to Respond, income inequality and economic justice summits, Black Lives Matter prayer vigils, and challenging discussions on white privilege. Moreover, district and regional leaders are being bold around the country. The Mid-America region was born several years ago with the consolidation of three districts into one regional structure. The four districts of the southern region eliminated their four district governance structures altogether, deferring to the UU board on governance matters, ends, and to the UUA staff for operational activities, what we call means. Other regions are considering their unique approaches to streamline or eliminate costly and redundant governance structures. There's no shortage of bold actions taking place around our association. You've heard many from President Morales and the Leadership Council. I'd like to know what your congregation or community is doing that is bold, brave, and bodacious, particularly bodacious. I want to hear from you. We will shape, showcase the boldest and the most bodacious initiatives next year in Columbus with a featured general session slot, perhaps a workshop as well. We want to hear from you. Over the past year, I have visited 16 congregations and participated in 14 conferences and too many webinars and conference calls to count. Generally, I see positive trends that suggest more and more religious professionals and lay leaders have growing confidence that the collaboration between board and staff are improving the efficacy of our governance structures. Moreover, the focus of the board and staff on monitoring progress towards our ends or shared vision has been noticed and appreciated. More specifically, my observations from these visits and interactions can be cataloged into three broad areas that bear reporting. One, the concern that the Board of Trustees reimagining governance initiatives appear to be an attempt to concentrate power. Two, the challenge of making GA more inclusive and financially accessible. And three, the need to recognize that covenant is both a noun and a verb. First, the 
concerned that the Board of Trustees reimagining governance initiatives appear to be an attempt to concentrate power. These voices, these tend to be voices that do not value the Board's initiatives to continue the path begun years ago to reimagine and restructure governance to be more effective. There are several initiatives that have created some anxiety in the system. The move to a smaller board of two years ago, the recent movement of four districts in the southern region to dissolve their governance structures and rely on the UUA board as the singular governance entity, the proposed bylaw amendment this year to change the commission on appraisal to a smaller appointed rather than elected commission, as well as the proposed bylaw amendment to remove the ability of districts and regions to place bylaw amendment and business resolutions on the agenda. All of these initiatives are seen by some as an attempt to concentrate power. It shouldn't surprise you, I don't see it that way. Over time, institutionally, we have developed systems and practices of governance that kept us focused on the internal workings of governance of our association and not as focused outward to our mission. We simply must do better. The model the Board of Trustees and I are working toward is intended to unburden our staff as well as unleash the hundreds of talented and dedicated volunteers now working on governance-related concerns to do the work of justice-making. The Board has developed and continues to consider new models for broad-based inclusion and input to governance decisions. You'll hear more about that. We must continue our efforts of modeling and communicating our efforts at transparency and linkage with our sources of authority and accountability. This will better frame our work and efforts to balance the cost of governance with the benefits to our congregations. While we have been live streaming our board meetings when meeting in Boston, posting our board agenda, packets, and minutes on the website, and hosting post-board meeting reporting and pre-GA webinars, our efforts are not reaching many people. So we're committed to finding way, better ways, new ways to make use of social media to communicate and demonstrate our transparency and encourage feedback. As I've traveled the country, I've spoken to these issues and the, all of these governance related changes are in fact for the purpose of making the governance structure more accountable and accessible to congregations. My congregational visits and our board linkage activities have spoken to the need for more congregations to elect, charge, send, and financially support delegates to general assemblies and seek a more inclusive delegate body who will be accountable to their own congregations and the larger movement. These delegate attributes are essential if we are to create a representative delegate body that is critical to our democratic process. Second, the challenge of making GA more inclusive and financially accessible comes up over and over in linkage conversations and surveys. I have proposed to the board that we create a pilot scholarship program for General Assembly in Columbus, Ohio in 2016. The objective of the project would be to attract traditionally underrepresented constituencies as delegates that would otherwise not be asked by their congregation or able to attend. <laughs> Partnering with the GA Planning Committee, we would expect to increase the number of delegates by 10% over our current ad hoc approach. This pilot scholarship program will be initially funded by a special collection at GA on Saturday that will provide seed money to jumpstart the pilot for 2016. Additionally, we would engage the stewardship and development staff to ensure that special collection is appropriately monitored to ensure donors' intentions are honored. If the pilot project meets its objectives, then we would make these scholarship funds part of the governance budget going forward. The program imagines that congregations who participate would seek to elect youth, young adult, people of color, and other historically marginalized people to represent those congregations as delegates to GA in Columbus in 2016. The registration fee would be borne by the pilot program and the congregation would be expected to underwrite some of the travel expenses in conjunction with other funding sources that might be available. 
There would be pre-GA web meetings to prepare these delegates for their responsibilities, orient them to the process, and support them during GA. There would be post-GA web meetings and surveys to assess the success of the program in targeting a different demographic to the delegate body and congregations who have not sent delegates in recent years. Third, and finally, the need to recognize that covenant is both a noun and a verb. Too often I see congregational leaders speak of covenant only in the context of controlling unhealthy behaviors rather than an expression of how we manifest our love for one another and the world. <laughs> covenant, covenant is both the commitment and the means to practice engagement in community. It is both a noun, the promise itself, and a verb, the practice that manifests the promise. Covenant is the collective commitment to and practice of religious community that we embrace when we say we are a covenantal faith tradition. Covenanting, the gerund, must be intentional if we are to be counter the forces of individual and community isolation and institutional drift. We need to explore over the next months how we might change the conversation from membership to mutual covenant. What we have seen as we discussed emerging congregations and covenanting communities over the past year is that the practice of covenanting has energized some groups that appeared to be isolated and static. Let's imagine that rather than signing the book, people entered and were welcome into a covenant that would be renewed periodically. Imagine if congregations and communities entered and were welcomed into mutual covenant with the larger association that would be renewed periodically. This approach to covenanting would energize our movement and attract individuals who are increasingly just not interested in membership in yet another organization. But they do desire to get connected and stay connected in networks of connection to probe for and express affiliation. The process of covenanting is an activating impulse that connects our personal commitments in community, drawing individuals together to co-create a world of more love, more justice, and more peace. I will ask the board at our October meeting to consider how our association might imagine moving forward from the notion of membership in an institution to one of mutual covenant. A healthy Unitarian Universalist community that is alive with transforming power, moving our communities and the world toward more love, justice, and peace. Imagine what that would be like. Imagine what your congregation or community could do to be braver, bolder, yes, even bodacious, as you actively begin covenanting to create that community alive with transforming power. Imagine our collective and individual UU communities in the world with more love, more justice, and more peace. Are you ready to be that bold? That brave? That bodacious? Thank you. Now please welcome all of our trustees to the stage. Donna Harrison, your vice moderator, will introduce the Board of Trustees report. Good morning. The, <laughs> the Board of Trustees is very pleased to bring you our report this year. We believe that we have made significant progress in a number of areas and we would like to share those with you. In addition, we see some real challenges for our association, and we will share those with you as well. On the stage, we have all of the trustees of your UUA Board of Trustees, as well as our youth observer and our financial advisor. Several of them will be speaking to you as part of this report. 
the Reverend Rob Eller Isaacs will first talk to you about the progress we have made this year in our implementation of policy governance. Susan Weaver will share with you the work that the board and others have done regarding ministry and our institutional response in the wake of clergy or professional misconduct. Julian Sharp will share the work of the board's inclusion working group and especially the board's response to several responsive resolutions that had been previously passed by General Assembly. And lastly, I will share with you some information about our initiative to transform the way that we do General Assembly and governance together. Rob? Thank you, Donna. Change is challenging. Some of you may have heard that. Governance at its best is, a, is about deciding what we will promise to each other and to the world. Once we've made those promises, governance is about making sure we're doing our best to make our promises come true. We need to ask whether or not our association is having the impact it intends. We call that process monitoring. Over the past two years, the UUA board and the administration have made significant progress toward asking the right questions at the right time. Working together, we're learning the art of evaluation. At the beginning of the governance change, there was extensive misunderstanding by both senior members of the administration and by many board members about exactly what should constitute effective monitoring. That situation, along with the nature of and number of policies requiring formal monitoring reports, helped to create an adversarial environment between the administration and the board. Our most important accomplishment in the past two years is that we have moved from that oppositional dynamic to a far more respectful, cooperative, and mutually accountable way of working together. In 2009, when we began policy governance monitoring, we had 115 executive limitations and sub-policies, all of which were monitored annually. We now have 47 executive limitation policies, some of which are monitored by direct inspection by the Audit Committee as part of their annual audit responsibilities. The monitoring schedule has been totally revised so that policies that really require close board attention are monitored annually, but others are monitored as infrequently as every 10 years. I want to assure you that these changes have strengthened the board's ability to exercise appropriate oversight while not interfering with day-to-day -day operations. The board is grateful for the assistance of the Audit Committee for their work in recommending various policy changes based on actual risk, thereby reducing the number of monitorable policies while maintaining the highest standards of fiscal accountability. In January of 2010, we had 140 policies that directed the operation of the board. All of them called for monitoring reports, most of them annual. After a careful redaction, consolidation, and reassignment of reporting requirements, we have 14 such policies. We have made executive limitations monitoring much easier while assuring that the board can fulfill its responsibilities. The board is excited about the progress President Morales and his team have made on ENDS monitoring. We are seeing a holistic approach evolving where the data gathered for monitoring has an energizing potential to help both the board and the staff understand where things are really working well and where we still fall short. I want to thank the many thoughtful and dedicated former trustees and past moderators 
who recognized the need to clarify and strengthen our governance process, and especially I want to thank retiring trustee and governance team member Lou Finney for his years <laughs> of focused attention to tracking the changes being made. The trustees are pleased with our progress in moving toward manageable and effective ways to evaluate and so to strengthen the work of your association. The administration's view is best summed up by President Morales, who writes, I am delighted and frankly surprised by how our relationship has improved. Our work is focused, thoughtful, and mission-driven. It has become a true religious partnership. Moderator Key at General Assembly in Providence last summer pledged to hold all of us accountable to values at our core in addressing issues of clergy sexual misconduct. More transparency and more compassion was needed, particularly in the process of bringing a complaint of such misconduct to the association. This year, the board the Ministerial Fellowship Committee and UUA staff have each taken steps to ensure parties to the complaint process are treated with care, respect, and fairness. Individuals who bring such complaints now have more voice in the review process. When an accused minister is invited to meet with the MFC Executive Committee, a complainant will be similarly invited. To underscore our commitment that investigation of a complaint will be objective and unbiased, no member of the MFC, the body that reviews the complaint, will serve on the investigation team. In approving these MFC rule changes, the board invited comment from an advisory group that includes survivors of misconduct. The board has recommended to the MFC best practices for receiving, investigating, and resolving such complaints. The practices were suggested to ensure the basic fairness, transparency, and integrity of the complaint process. The MFC quickly responded and made policy changes that provide better communications with complainants and greater assurance of fairness and transparency. More information on the work of the board the MFC and UUA staff in this area is available in the Building Restorative Justice Workshop on Friday afternoon and also on the UUA Board of Trustees webpage. We hope that voices of survivors continue to be included in this work, which the MFC will continue in the coming year. Any survivor who would like to comment on recent MFC policy changes should contact the board or moderator key. We respect privacy. We will not actively seek you out, but welcome your concerns. I thank SafetyNet, the social justice organization from First Unitarian Universalist Church of Nashville, which first called for a national discussion of clergy sexual misconduct. And I thank all members of the advisory group. We have learned from you. It is your determination and compassion, despite your pain, despite your doubts of being heard, that leads us to be a more caring community. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Julian Sharp, and I serve as chair of the Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group. I serve alongside Benji Janapol, Michael Solwasser and Christina Rivera. Our working group is tasked with assessing and furthering our deep commitment to become an anti-oppressive, multicultural, and truly welcoming board and association. Our major focus this year has been on assessing practices and education with UUA committees that deepen our commitment to an anti-oppressive and multicultural movement. Two years ago, this body passed a responsive resolution entitled deepening our commitment to an anti-oppressive, multicultural UUA. You requested your board to, quote, ensure that the board and staff appointed 
Board appointed and elected committees of the association are empowered and encouraged to identify existing and new practices and structures that will lead to greater diversity among participants in the work of those committees and a greater sense of inclusion among participants and that will provide for youth and young adult led efforts. Your board and, and particularly the Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group takes this work very seriously. We have interviewed the chairs of the association's committees to better understand what practices they currently have in place, how new members are welcomed and oriented to the work, and how each chair understands the mission of their committee as it relates to countering racism and oppression and fostering multiculturalism. Our full report with recommendations will be made available following the October board meeting. Today, I'd like to share two initial findings with you. First, while all committee chairs have sought out some form of training and competency building as it relates to anti-racism, anti-oppression, and multiculturalism, we were surprised to learn that the vast majority of committee chairs are in fact the same people who lead trainings and design educational opportunities to deepen these commitments. We also found that when committees are given greater financial resources, they de develop better tools to address anti-oppression and multiculturalism. While this is not surprising, it indicates the high prioritization of this work within the committees. This General Assembly, the board will welcome not one, but two new youth observers. We continue to invite youth into the boardroom because we know that our youth bring insight, creativity, and energy to our work. This spring, the board came to the conclusion that we would be best served by two youth observers. This decision was based in part on our anti-racism, anti-oppression, and multicultural model, which recognizes that youth are in a unique period of transition and have special safety considerations. This model better supports both the youth observers and the board. Thank you for your support and dedication to building beloved community. In 2010, the UUA board passed a motion that established three priorities and indeed three commitments for improving the governance of our association. One of these has been accomplished, putting in place a much smaller UUA board of trustees. The second is well underway, which is to better align the role of districts and regions with our UUA governance structure and our polity. This initiative dealing with the districts and regions is intended partly to free the staff of our Unitarian Universalist Association, our staff, from multiple layers of oversight, sometimes conflicting, and also, as moderator Key mentioned, to free literally hundreds of talented volunteers to do other and hopefully more meaningful work for Unitarian Universalism and the future of our faith. The third initiative has taken longer to gain traction, but I believe that in many ways it has the potential to be the mo most transformational of the three for us. And this is the initiative to change and transform General Assembly and the way that we all work together to make the fundamental decisions that guide our association. Done right, this can make our governance much more inclusive and much more engaging, and it will make it more likely that we will spend our time together focused on the issues that really do matter to the future of our faith and our association. The board has been listening to literally thousands of Unitarian Universalists over the past several years. And in fact, this conversation has been going on for at least a decade. And as a result of that time spent listening, we have developed some concrete ideas. We will be sharing what we have learned and those ideas in a variety of forums throughout this General Assembly, beginning with some time in the general session on Friday morning and followed by a board-sponsored workshop on Friday afternoon. I'm not going to be able to share with you during this board report 
in detail the ideas, but I can say that there are several major priorities that drive our work. First, we envision a governance process that is much more engaging, even fun, and meaningful. We envision a process that is more inclusive, economically and culturally, than what we have in place today. And finally, we envision an agenda that is dominated by the issues that really matter to the future of our faith, our association, and our shared work of ministry in the world. The work that we do together at this General Assembly will set the foundation for action and voting at upcoming General Assemblies, we hope in 2016, and we look forward to conversation with you. In closing of the board report, I would like to highlight that there are a variety of opportunities throughout this weekend together to interact with the board on the topics that we have highlighted in this report and other topics. I especially want to mention the session on Saturday as part of program session eight, where the candidates for the UUA Board of Trustees, as well as the current members of the board, will be present. This is an opportunity for you to ask questions and for us to have conversation. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Donna, and all of the trustees for your work on behalf of this faith that we love. I want to especially recognize Donna Harrison, whom you just heard from, Reverend Susan Ritchie, Reverend Sarah Stewart, and Lou Finney, who complete their board service at the end of this GA. Join me in thanking them. And our, and our youth, and our youth uh, observer who will be cycling off this session, Johnny Johnapole, thank you. As I indicated in my report, we've been uh, focused on emerging congregations and communities this year, which is focused on the coveting process that I referenced earlier. Out of that attention to these new communities came the good news that I've invited some folks to share with you. Please welcome Trustee James Snell. It's going to be big. Wow. At GA in Providence, the board reported that we had formed a collaborative emerging congregations working group with the UUA staff. We stated that our goal was to more quickly bring some 50 emerging congregations and communities the UUA staff had identified into relationship with our association and on a path to membership. The UUA's work since Providence to foster growth and new relationships with the emerging UU congregations and communities underscores how important it is to intentionally build relationships. In pursuit of the goal of this work, the UUA reached out to these emerging groups. The revelationary question they asked these communities was, how do you covenant? This question was asked because an earlier survey had revealed that more of the emerging congregations and communities had Facebook pages than had a covenant. This work, these covenant conversations the staff held with emerging UU communities was significant and productive. The UUA staff reported to the board at our March meeting in Birmingham that these deep conversations have helped five of the emerging communities seek membership in the UUA at this GA. 
Another dozen of these communities are moving into an intentional relationship with us, and we are recognizing them here as covenanting communities. So, yes, it's awesome. How do we expand our initiatives to foster the growth of our UU faith community? First, each of you has the power to expand our faith. The UUA is you, our member congregations and communities. You might do many things. Importantly, if you are part of a new community looking for a way to connect to Unitarian Universalism, know that we want to be in relationship with you. Find out if there are UU groups meeting in your community and support them. Add new forms of worship that are more welcoming to the diversity you see in your visitors. Create services that reach out to youth and young adults in your communities. Partner with other congregations in your area to make your collective resources available to all congregations. Pursue a new mission outside of your walls, perhaps even start a satellite sanctuary in an underserved area of your community. Secondly, the UUA staff, supported by your APF contributions, is here to coach, connect, and co-learn with you. Our UUA staff has, under, has created a comprehensive system of support for all emerging ministries. I see, see this as support as a highway with many lanes, helping you map out where you want to go and giving you the tools to get there. And so today, we not only celebrate all of these new communities, but also a new commitment on behalf of your UUA to support new ways of being and accompanying UU religious communities in all the forms those take. I would now like to introduce your vice moderator, Donna Harrison, who will help us welcome our new member congregations. This is one of the most fun things I get to do at General Assembly. At every General Assembly, we welcome new congregations into our association of congregations, and it is a time of real joy for all of us, as well as for the members of those congregations. According to our bylaws, one of the primary purposes of our association is to organize new congregations. The work that the board and the staff are doing to create momentum and energy around emerging congregations and covenanting communities speaks directly to this call in our founding documents. This year, as James mentioned, we are welcoming five brand new congregations into our association. Yeah, that, it is worth an applause. <laughs> This is as many as we welcomed over the past three years combined. Yeah. And I know that you share my hope that this is the beginning of an upward trajectory. And as I introduce the congregations, I would like to invite Moderator Key and President Morales to join me here to welcome them. We, have, we don't have representatives from all of the congregations here, but we hold all of them in our hearts. So as I list them, if there are representatives here, they can join me up here. So the first is All Souls in Miami, Florida. The, the Iowa Lakes Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Okaboji, Iowa. The the Open Door Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Owensboro, Kentucky. Welcome. The St. Croix Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in St. Croix Falls, Wisconsin.
and the Unitarian Universalist Bedenock Fellowship in Escanaba, Michigan. I also want to highlight that we have a newly formed congregation that has come about as the result of two congregations coming together. The Paint Branch Unitarian Universalists of Rochester, Michigan, and the Emerson Unitarian Universalists of Troy, Michigan, have talked and researched and worked together and reached the conclusion that they are better together, merged, and now we welcome this new resulting congregation, the Beacon Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Troy, Michigan. And now, please welcome your UUA staff Emerging Congregations team. Tandy Rogers and Annie Gonzalez Milliken, the Emerging Ministry Support Coordinators, along with Teresa Cooley, Program and Strategies Officer, who oversees all this goodness, Carrie McDonald, Director of Outreach, who will help introduce the covenanting communities, and Scott Taylor, Director of Congregational Life, who will introduce multi-site partnership. As I call their name, I'm gonna ask you to hold your applause and instead send your prayers and good wishes to these pioneering communities behind me, before you. Are you ready to receive the goodwill of your siblings in faith, to which you are now officially belong, and them to you? I present to you Buffalo Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Buffalo, Minnesota. And many of them are live streamed and watching also, so you can send it into the ethers. The covenant of Unitarian Universalist pagans in virtual and multiple locations. Lucy Stone Cooperative in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Metau Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Twisp, Washington. North Kitsap Unitarians in Pullsbo, Washington. Peninsula Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Port Orchard, Washington. Prairie Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Hutchinson, Kansas. Sacred Fire Community in Carborough, North Carolina and growing in locations. Sacred Path Unitarian Universalist Church, Indianapolis, Indiana. The Welcome Table in Turley, Oklahoma. The Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Salina, Kansas. Unitarian Universalists of Goldendale, Washington. Give them all a round of applause. And now we welcome and honor our multi-site partnership networks. The first we recognize is the First Unitarian Church of Albuquerque and its branch campuses, Desert Springs UU, Carlsbad, Edgewood, Socorro Unitarian Universalists. The First Unitarian Universalist San Diego and its branch campus, South Bay Campus, Chula Vista. The Houston Network, which includes the First Unitarian Church of Houston, the First UU Church of Houston Copperfield, the First Unitarian Church of Houston Thoreau Safford Campus. <laughs> and also the Jefferson Unitarian Church Golden, Colorado and its branch campuses, Jefferson Unitarian Church Evergreen and Jefferson Unitarian Church Golden. Then Piedmont Salisbury Partnership, which includes the Piedmont Unitarian Universalist Church and the Piedmont UU Church Salisbury Gathering. Then the Rochester, New York and Canandaigua, New York Partnership, which includes the First Unitarian Church of Rochester, New York 
and the UU Church of Canandaigua, New York. The Rockton, Rockford, McHenry Theme Network Partnership, which includes Rock Valley, the UU Church in Rock Valley, and the Tree of Life Congregation. Then the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg and its branch campuses, the Unitarian Church of Harrisburg and the Swatara Township, and also the Allison Hill neighborhood. And finally, the Seven Church Youth Collaborative, which includes First Church Parish in Taunton, Massachusetts, Murray Church in Attleboro, Massachusetts, the First Parish Bridgewater Unitarian Universalist Church in Massachusetts, and the First Unitarian Society of Middleborough, Massachusetts, and Foxborough, Massachusetts, New Bedford, Massachusetts, and Northeastern, Massachusetts. For all these, we are grateful. See what coveting can do? It energizes communities. We can grow our faith by doing what these folks are doing. Thank you very much for being here. I'd now like to, um, I'd like for you to uh, hear from our, the Reverend Sarah Stewart, trustee of our association and chair of the finance committee for the budget report. I'm Sarah Stewart, minister of the First Unitarian Church in Worcester, Massachusetts, UA trustee and chair of the Finance Committee. I'm here to report on the budget the board adopted UA at our April teleconference meeting and share some thoughts on the opportunities and limitations we see in the UUA's operating budget. The Unitarian Universalist Association is in a stronger financial position than ever. The final purchase of the new headquarters building at 24 Farnsworth Street took place in January 2015. With this purchase and the sale of the UUA's three properties on Beacon Hill, a total of $7.7 .7 million was added to our endowment. In addition, we now receive lease revenue on the top three floors of 24 Farnsworth Street, which are valued at $13.3 million. And these new assets are offset by a loan secured to underwrite the build out of our beautiful new headquarters in the amount of $10 million. So here is the only math in this report. $7.7 .7 million in unrestricted funds, plus $13.3 million worth of rented offices, which generate lease income to support the operating budget, equals $21 million in new assets on our balance sheet, $10 million of which is being used to underwrite a loan, leaving $11 million in new unencumbered assets going to work for Unitarian Universalism. By investing the proceeds of the sale of the Beacon Hill properties in the endowment and in real estate, we are keeping faith with our ancestors who built our historic headquarters. These donations were intended to benefit Unitarian Universalism over the long term. By not spending these resources on immediate needs, however pressing, we are investing in the future of our faith. In addition, the new headquarters are functional, beautiful, and welcoming. I believe that the move to a modern, technologically sound, unified headquarters will prove to be a lasting and beneficial legacy of President Morales' administration. The operating budget of the UUA, however, continues to feel the restraints it has since the Great Recession in 2008. To weather that recession, the UUA came more and more to rely on big individual gifts and bequests, to supplement income from congregational giving, smaller individual gifts, and the endowment. At the end of fiscal year 2014, the administration realized it was facing a significant shortfall in large individual gifts 
resulting in layoffs and a planned additional endowment draw. In fiscal year 2015, the year we're just ending, a previous gift of mineral rights was sold profitably, realizing $944,000 to be put toward the mission of the UUA. This unexpected income made the proposed endowment draw unnecessary. We are deeply grateful to Lois and Ken Carpenter, who made that original donation of mineral rights, and to all who give in amounts large and small to the UUA. Still, this year's budget is nearly the same as last year's. Personnel cuts were largely not restored. The regional subcommittees on candidacy will be phased out. Your dedicated staff continue to do their good work, but with less support. Programs are feeling the squeeze. The RSCC phase out is a good example of this. The program, which has interviewed UU seminarians during their formation to make sure they're on the right track before they see the Ministerial Fellowship Committee, has not accomplished all the goals originally hoped for. Now, this is partly because sometimes you try new things and they don't work perfectly, and it is partly because the RSCCs were underfunded after their earliest years. Just as we do in our churches, the UUA needs to try new things, to experiment, to continue to work toward the best programs to serve congregations. But in this case, the replacement program to support our seminarians, an in-care system to work with them throughout their formation, is currently in development and not yet funded nationally. If we want the UUA to be able to fund an in-care system or other new programs, to support ministries and congregations, new revenues will have to be developed. So what will new revenues look like? We have already seen that too much immediate dependence on large individual gifts is not wise. As grateful as we are for those Unitarian Universalists who are very generous to the association. The largest source of potential revenue growth for the UUA is congregational giving most commonly known as the APF. The APF amplifies Unitarian Universalism. It takes one congregation's voice and joins it with the voices of all the other congregations to make a real difference for each other and for our world. Congregational giving is how we show our support not only for all the services we receive from the UUA, but for all our sibling congregations throughout the UUA. If our endowment income and bequest income represent the commitments of past Unitarian Universalists and their hopes and dreams for our faith, then our congregational giving represents our shared participation in that commitment. It is a way we keep a covenant with each other and with our heritage, on behalf of the present and future of Unitarian Universalism. So if the UUA is going to be able to do more and be more and have an even louder amplified voice for Unitarian Universalism, we need to think about what our congregations can do. When has the UUA really excited you? When have you said, I am so glad we have the UUA. When have you given thanks for your district or regional staff who are part of the UUA? When have you been proud and happy to have that amplified faith, that bigger voice that is possible when we all speak together? We, your trustees, want to hear what would help your congregation become an honor congregation, if you're not already there, and we would love to hear why you are an honor congregation if you are. Your stewardship and development staff and your district and regional staff would like to hear the same thing. Congregational giving to the UUA, that commitment that helps amplify Unitarian Universalism is the growth mechanism for our future. It is our yes to our ancestors' dreams and our promise to future generations of religious liberals. 
This year's UUA budget is one yes. By working together, that yes can get louder and stronger in every year to come. If you want more details of the budget and the financial plan for the UUA for next year, I invite you to the budget hearing. It will be held on Friday at 1.15 p.m. in room B110 to 112. It has been a privilege and an honor to serve this association as trustee and chair of the Finance Committee. Thank you for your commitment to Unitarian Universalism. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Now I'm going to give you a little heads up. We're running a little long, not a lot long. You're not going to miss the, uh, the first workshop you've signed up for, but we will run probably till about 1025. We're about 10 minutes behind, but I want you to stay for the, we have two very good uh, GA talks that I think you must hear. The objectives of these talks is to spread ideas that spark conversation about Unitarian Universalism that are worth spreading. The idea for these GA talks came from the Young Adult Caucus and they have branded their talks YA at GA. So it's appropriate that our first GA talk is from one of our young adult leaders, Ruth Hinkle. Ruth? Hello, my name is Ruth and I have been a Unitarian Universalist my entire life. I was asked to share my bridging story with you. You should probably know that I was a bit of a poster child for church involvement. Not only did I attend church every Sunday, but I served as a leader in my youth group. For three years, I was a member of my district's youth steering committee, which planned five to seven conferences a year. At the Midwest UU Summer Assembly, where I've attended since I was six, I planned worships every year in middle and high school. As a senior in high school, I co-wrote a curriculum on youth worship. So, as you might imagine, I really didn't think I could become disconnected from my faith. Sure, I'd heard about how young adults drift away or disappear. I'd heard that some returned and some didn't. I'd even seen it happen to my friends. But I was determined it wouldn't happen to me. And you know, I thought I had a fighting chance. I continued to live with my family in the church that's seven minutes away in the house. I live in a house, uh, seven minutes away from the church. I stopped going to youth group and stayed for the whole service. It's tempting, I think, to suggest that the services just didn't do it for me. After all, us millennials, we want cool, hip churches. We're being told left and right that churches are dying and if we don't attract those young folks, we're doomed. But here's the thing, I liked the services. My transition coincided with the arrival of a new minister. He did a lot of things I liked. I found his sermons challenging and insightful. I loved the direction the music took. And I enjoyed that those services touched me emotionally. And it didn't matter. Something was missing. It took me a while to figure out that I was lonely. When I did figure it out, I did the only thing I could think of, join a committee. <laughs> yep, that's right. I was so desperate to deepen connections with the people who raised me that I took on the stress and extra work of a committee. Before I move further, I want to draw your attention to two things. The first is that around 90% of church members found Unitarian Universalism as adults. That's an astonishing percentage to consider. Which brings me to my second point. Around 90% of church members have no idea what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist for youth, unless they have a chance to experience it as a chaperone or mentor. In a poignant post on her raised 
on the Raised UU Facebook page, Nina West shared her experience with liberal religious youth, or LRY, an earlier incarnation of youth culture. She wrote, because I grew up with a model of a high level of responsibility for and with my fellow youth and within my congregation, I expected that to be part of a community meant to participate a lot, to be very hands-on. She continues saying, this idea that my religion, my congregation, is something I am expected to participate in a lot. That's central to how I grew up as UU. I think of that as essentially UU. I was struck by Nina's words. Participation is a fundamental value of youth culture. Religious education classrooms encourage participation from all voices, which are, of course, inherently worthy. At the beginning of conferences, youth collaborate to create a covenant for the weekend. Youth worship is designed around participation and community building. The most successful worships I ran were the ones where I accurately judged the closeness of the group and pushed them to get to know each other even better. Vulnerability is valued and cherished. The spaces of youth community become sacred despite the smell of unwashed teenager. My friend Taylor recently described youth community as a warm, safe nest. I love these words. Have you ever woken up feeling cocooned, protected, and warm? There are those mornings where the bed and your blankets just feel so right, and you can't bear to break the spell. Now imagine that someone rips off those covers. The chill of the room shocks you. You stumble out of bed, fumbling for something to protect your body. It's not a pleasant experience. Why would you do that? In many ways, this is what we ask of youth when they graduate. They are forced out of youth group, youth conferences, and youth portions of camps and assemblies. They have no choice about leaving. After 18 years of nurturing their bodies and souls, we deposit them at the foot of a metaphorical bridge and send them on their merry way. Now, can you imagine the differences between the youth culture I described and sitting in a Sunday service? In youth culture, you create your experiences in a Sunday service, you typically receive your experience prepackaged. Now, imagine trying to get that warm, cuddly feeling from a committee. Right? If you're wondering what you can do to support youth as they transition, start by talking with youth, their parents, and congregation members. The first rule is just ask. Here are some questions to get you started. Does your congregation have a deep relationship with your youth? If not, what's preventing that connection? Do you talk about youth as byproducts of your church? Are you taking credit for their awesomeness without participating in their culture? How do you maintain relationships with youth? after they graduate. In an article called Want Millennials Back in the Pews, Stop Trying to Make Church Cool, Rachel Held Evans wrote that she returned to church because of the sacraments. She said, the sacraments don't need to be repackaged or rebranded. They just need to be practiced, offered, and explained in the context of a loving, authentic, and inclusive community loving, authentic, and inclusive. Yeah, that's where I want to be. I'm still here because I don't expect perfect community. But I do expect communities that are willing to look deeply at themselves. Do you think you can do that for me? Thank you.
Preach it, Ruth, preach it. Now I want to introduce the Reverend Dr. Miguel A. De La Torre. He is a professor of social ethics and Latino Latina studies at the Illus School of Theology in Denver, Colorado, and executive officer of the Society of Wraiths, Ethnicity, and Religion. He's a theologian activist whose writing, teaching, preaching, and speaking is intended to move people of faith towards creating justice and living in solidarity with the oppressed. He's launching today's first ever GA Mosaic Make or Track a four-part workshop series that stems from Mosaic Makers leading vital multicultural congregations. That's a national conference that considers four pillars of international intentional multicultural community. Leadership, worship, justice ministry, and congregational life. And worship, of course, as being critical for building multicultural sensitivity, sensibility, and community. He served as main presenter at the 2014 Mosaic Conference hosted by First Unitarian Tulsa. Welcome, Miguel. Buenos dias. I am honored to be here because I know Unitarian Universalists want to be part of building the beloved community. That has been difficult for you because you have historically been a white denomination with the added burdens of affluence and education. This does not mean you cannot work towards the dream. It means you will have to go deeper to understand how you will participate in shaping and realizing the future. I am so happy to see how your workshops are designed to help develop your understanding of the mosaic wheel by focusing on justice making, accountable leadership, community life, and worship. These four pillars are key to the transformative work in which you are engaged as people of faith. But this work is not easy. The pitfalls are many, and the shortcuts are too tempting. For example, that great modern day theologian, Stephen Colbert of the former The Colbert Report, accepted application for the position of his very own black friend. Realizing the importance of political correctness, Colbert thought it would be crucial to have a black friend he could point to just in case he was ever accused of being a racist. He was so committed to the effort of not appearing to be racist that he had to ask someone else before choosing from the pool of applicants which ones were black, because he was, of course, colorblind. <laughs> Colbert's approach to racially and ethnically diversifying his cadre of friends is similar to the shortcuts many take in diversifying their churches. For some, the hopes of diversification is more for the sake of political correctness rather than creating the beloved community. And while I appreciate the overtures made to include people of color into your fold, I must ask, why do you assume I will want to worship at your church? After centuries of exclusion, why should I come a running now that you think it makes your church look good by having a black or brown face in the pew to prove that your congregations aren't racist? It is difficult for people of color to pray while sitting next to the banker who will charge me an extra point of interest because my last name is Latino. It is, it is hard to shout praises while being stared by the police officer who gave me a ticket for driving while under the influence of being Hispanic. It's challenging to proclaim the mercies of my God knowing that sitting across the aisle is a parishioner who refuses to show mercy towards the undocumented. Un Unless those within the congregation begin to honestly and seriously deal with white supremacy and class privilege, 
it is unlikely that believers of color will ignore the realities outside the church building and just come on in. We don't have time for churches to perfect their strategies before doing the justice work of reconciliation because statistical trends reveal that as a nation, we are becoming more segregated. For the past half millennium, racial and ethnic forms of economic oppressions have been normalized and legitimized in the eyes of the overwhelming majority of rural Americans, an entrenched understanding that has found religious justification. Due to the civil rights movement of the 1960s and other anti-racist, anti-colonial, and democratizing movements throughout the world, the way whites construct reality had, was radically changed and challenged. Nonetheless, repackaging white supremacy that secured structural inequalities and injustices under the concept of color blindness, preserved the historical racial hegemony, thus a mass racism and ethnic discrimination persists in our churches. Unfortunately, claiming color blindness simply replaced racial domination with a racial hegemony that poses questions concerning the struggle for justice on a universal rather than on a corporate plane by integrating the opposition so as to nullify the more radical demands. The, <coughs> the reconciliation forged and advocated what was a colorblind reconciliation that enacted anti-racist laws while failing to fundamentally change or transform the social structures that maintain and sustain racism. The more radical demands of the civil rights movement, i.e. equitable distribution of wealth, resources, and opportunities, was sacrificed in favor of limited economic, political, and cultural access to power and privilege for a minority of middle-class people of color. To claim the ideal of colorblindness allows church folk to approach racism on an individual rather than communal level. Euro Americans can downplay, if not outright ignore, the importance of initiating social political acts that challenge the present embedded social structures that are detrimental to communities of color. For them, reconciliation is achieved through personal relationships across racial and ethnic lines, kind of like Colbert having a black friend. Stressing individual level actions over and against changing social structures allows those who are privileged by those same structures to feel righteous because of the public apologies offered with crocodile deers for past racist acts. Meanwhile, they could continue to benefit from the status quo that protects Eurocentric privilege. We are thus faced with the question, what is the best advice that can be given to whites living in a so-called post-racial society wishing to diversify their institution? Or to answer Rodney King's immortal question, can't we all just get along? Now, here's my disclaimer. I am an ordained Southern Baptist Latino preacher. So what I'm about to say should not be all that shocking. No church or institution should consider diversifying unless they first get saved. More specifically, they must nail their white supremacy and class privilege onto the cross so that they be become a new creature. Becoming a new creature is not to be taken figuratively, but literally. The question that must be asked is how much must the institution is willing to change to die to itself to become a new locale where all can come, where all are welcome?
the institution wishing to diversify will never succeed while holding on to the attitude, well, that's the way we've always done it, and if you want to join us, you have to become like us. The question we must ask is if we are committed to building a new way, can we commit to the necessity that Black Lives Matter before rushing to All Lives Matter? Although we may all come from spiritually indifferent paths, we still are attempting to form one body, one very diverse body. The Apostle Paul was among the first to see the importance of diversity. In his first epistle to the Corinthian, Paul wrote, there are varieties of gifts, yet the same spirit. There's a variety of ministries, yet the same Lord. There's a variety of working in all sorts of different people, yet the same God who is working in all of them. You see, for Paul, because we represent different traditions, we all offer different gifts and different ministries. Our unity as a body does not come from watering down difference, races, ethnicities, or orientations, so that we can become more your American in thought action, and actions. Rather, our diversity makes unity possible, especially when that diversity is manifested in community life and worship. Paul reminds us that just as the human body is made of different parts, yet remains a single unit, so too is it with this general assembly. Therefore, it would be ridiculous for the foot to insist that the eye also be a foot. Likewise, it is ridiculous for a Euro-American to insist that the Latino must sing 300-year-old German hymns if they want to properly praise the creator of all. <laughs> Likewise, it is absurd that African Americans must follow a Eurocentric liturgy in order to be more spiritual. If all parts conform to the will of one of its parts, how then could that be a body? The parts may be different, but the body remains one. I know that the first Mosaic workshop is called, Why Do We You Use Cross the Road? Crossing the road is about justice ministry. The doing, orthopraxis, and not the believing, orthodoxy, is the answer for creating the beloved community. Moving beyond Stephen Colbert's political correctness requires the dominant culture's consciousness to be raised to consider the struggles of the neighbor of color without being defensive. The church discovers its own salvation through its solidarity with the marginalized. One engages in the process of liberation not to achieve the ultimate goal of having more faces of color in the congregation. One engages in the process of liberation for the sole purpose of becoming the church. Then, and only then, can we become one body poised in turning the world upside down. Gracias. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Miguel. That was wonderful. Now, those are some ideas worth sharing, don't you think? Absolutely. And thanks for staying. And it's almost over. Now it's time to call on the secretary of our association, the Reverend Dr. Susan Ritchie, for any announcements. Do we have some? I guess we do. The uh, program number 318, Bodies Count, um, that was scheduled for 1 p.m. today has been canceled. Also a reminder that in the absence of delegate ribbons, when you approach a microphone for recognition, your voter card will be your credential. So please have that ready to show. And finally, um, while one of the great pleasures of General Assembly is welcoming visitors from afar, we do have one unwelcome and freakish guest among us. 
and that would be the unusually high temperatures, um, absolutely unknown in this part of the world. The heat begins to develop today and reaches potentially three digits on Saturday. So your General Assembly Volunteer Office has asked that I uh, implore you to dismonitor how you are in this heat and take good care of yourself and drink plenty of water from your reusable cups. Thank you, Susan. And I would add, I would add, um, don't stay away from the public witness event on Saturday because you think it's outdoors. It's not. It's here, it's here in the building, so you can stay cool. And before we uh, recess, uh, you know, I asked uh, last night how many people had been here over 35, 25, that sort of thing. I want to read you some names real quickly. Who was in the hall last night, and I hope are in this morning? Uh, the Reverend Bruce Southworth has over 25, uh, over 25 GAs under his belt. The Reverend Roger Bruin has 26. Carolyn Nolan Tolles and Tom Owen Coles, the Reverends, have 29. Uh, Reverend Arvid Straub has over 35. Wayne Arnes, uh, Jack Reich has 37. Uh, the Reverend Anita Farber Robertson has 40. Reverend Wayne Arneson has 45. But the winner is moderator Denny Davidoff at 47. Who knew? I'm trying to calculate how old I'll be when I have 47. It's not pretty. It's not pretty. Regarding tomorrow's general session, note that the singing starts at 745, and you don't want to miss that. Then a special uh, worship service starts at 8 to prepare us for our work together at 845. There being no further business to come before us, in accordance with the schedule set forth in your program book, I declare that this general session of the General Assembly shall stand in recess until 8.45 tomorrow morning, immediately following worship. Thank you.